You've written uh, that it's time for the Democrats to, t- uh, to trust the base. Uh, let's go through. And there's, you know, there's been a, a, a couple of big pieces about this, reported pieces about the relationship between the uh, DCCC and um, folks running in congressional primaries around the country. Um, And we should say the DCCC is the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. There's also a Senate version, the DSCC. Um, And they're distinct from the DNC, although we're talking about really a lot of the same people, a lot of the same mindset. But, but, But broadly speaking, what is that mindset? Yeah, so the big sense that they want to look for is they want to look for someone who, in finger quotes, is electable. Someone who fits a sort of mold, uh, quite often uh, the perfect candidate, if you could sort of invent that one for them, would be a white male small business owner who has center left policy views and a deep network of people who can fund their campaign. Um, And that is who they tend to support. And even with though there's been a lot of pressure um, to say add more women of color to the red to blue list, even if, after those women have won primaries, um, they've actually been incredibly slow to do that. All right. So let's let's go down a couple of examples that you talk about in the um, uh, in the piece before we we start talking about sort of what what is inhibiting their ability to get this message but uh tell us about uh, new york's 24th district yeah so this is one of the most uh offensive i think to progressives interview interventions this cycle um so there was a a woman named dana balter who is a uh, professor um, who had won the endorsement of groups like working families party and also the local indivisibles as well as the local democratic parties Um, and she had sort of consolidated support people were really excited for that candidacy and then the d triple c swooped in at the last moment and endorsed ahead of the primary uh, a woman named winita perez williams who had previously lost a a bid to be uh, mayor of Syracuse and who it turned out it surfaced had posted in favor of Ireland's abortion ban uh, on her Facebook. And they not only swooped in and sort of gave her that imperture of support, they then ran ads, coordinated ad buys with their campaign. So they were actually financially helping her campaign ahead of the primary. Um, And then uh, she lost the primary and they have refused to add red to blue uh, or Dana Balter to red to blue. So the DCCC's position was this was a winnable district when our candidate, when we had our preferred candidate. Now that we've lost that primary, it is no longer a winnable district, despite the fact that Dana Balter has showed, you know, she is the overwhelming preference of Democrats, Democratic voters in that district. And she has done basically fine in terms of fundraising. There's no evidence that. Uh, Perez Williams was a better fundraiser than Balter. So even by their own, you know, purported standards, uh, they are they are basically trying to shove it to progressives. And it's even worse in Nebraska second. Well, I want to talk about Nebraska second in a se- in, in a moment. But uh, but mm-hmm. but you're a data guy. Is there any do they have any data points that would suggest that they're correct? I mean, is there there's no polling at this stage, is there? I mean, ironically enough, Juanita Perez Williams released a poll claiming that she was 15 points up um, and then lost, you know, with one third of the vote. Um, so, it, you know, that was incredibly uh, deceptive. And, and, the, and the point being, it, so I guess I should say see, yeah. there's no accurate yeah. polling. All right. Is yeah. That, is that basically? Sam, okay. if, if you look at most of the polls that sort of come out, they'll have like these head to heads. And a thing that you need to keep in mind mentally is unless you're seeing a four to five point gap between the two of the, the candidates, like two of the Democrats that are being put head to head, those differences are not statistically indistinguishable with the sample sizes that these polls tend to be conducted with. So okay. there really is too much reading into um, too small uh, of an inf- information. So you'll sometimes see it where it's like, 
oh, you know, Stacey Abrams is up 43 to 33, but then Stacey Evans is up 42 to 33. You know, that's statistically indistinguishable. Those are the same number. So it doesn't really make sense um, for the party to intervene. I, that's a totally hypothetical example, but we can give a – we can do that for any race. And, and the other point is that money, um, once you've reached a sort of viability threshold – of you know having you know three hundred thousand dollars or so four hundred thousand dollars to sort of do the block and tackling of running a campaign, you know the money after that is nice to have, but you you've basically proven that you're a viable candidate, and so it doesn't really make sense for the D trip to cut you off, particularly because if they cut you off, it means it makes it harder for you to win. So the D trip is at this point sacrificing vulnerable districts. Um, out of spite for the progressive base. Well, that's what I was going to ask you was um, what, you know, the, I can understand maybe for whatever reason, they have an idea as to who someone would be better. They could be wrong in that instance, but to abandon the district after their preferred candidate who is theoretically stronger loses uh, just sounds like they don't want someone to win there because it's going to make them look bad. Yeah, and and it it's, it's an indication that they don't really trust the Democratic voters. Um, right. Yeah. Well, tell tell us about Nebraska. So Nebraska second is is an example in which there was a, a man named Brad Ashford who had won Nebraska second in the twenty fourteen um, an actual I will acknowledge quite impressive electoral performance um, to knock out an incumbent in in that cycle for a Democrat. Um, but he had actually been a you know long time sort of centrist donor. He had donated to both Republicans and Democrats, um, actually disproportionately Republicans. Um, and, and during his time in office, he was an incredibly centrist legislator, um, particularly on issues of immigration that are now very salient to Democratic primary voters. Um, specifically, he was one of only two Democrats that voted to defund um, Obama's DACA uh, executive mm. order. Um, <clears throat> so so he, he came in weak. The DCCC endorsed him. Um, you know, uh, presumably because when he was in the Democratic conference, he, he was raising money for the DCCC, uh, but also they, they perceived him to be a better candidate. Um, and he, he lost a primary against uh, a woman named Kerry Eastman. Uh, Eastman is is not a sort of, you know, fire breathing socialist or anything like that. But she's a standard issue progressive. She wants Medicare for all. She wants reproductive uh, freedom and choice. And she she wants a, a you know, path to citizenship and to protect uh, undocumented folks. And she also had, you know, pretty, pretty deep ties to the to the politics of the district because she had spent a lot of time as a, at a nonprofit executive. Um, but since since she's won that race, the DCCC has refused to add her to red to blue, uh, despite the fact that her fundraising numbers are uh, perfectly fine. Uh, they're actually pretty impressive. Um, she's been raising, you know, uh, definitely around the median for uh, Democratic challengers. And this is a district that easily could go to the Democrats. This is. This is a district that is seen by most uh, most election forecasters as a maybe lean Republican, uh, probably toss up district. All right. We, we, let's take a break. You've given us two examples of the DCCC weighing in uh, in primaries, losing or at least their preferred candidate losing. And then them basically saying, well, we're taking our ball and we're going home. Uh, sort of losing sight of the mission, which is let's get Democrats elected. And and the thing is, the problem seems to be they're making their assessments without really, it seems to me, to be in the dark. Um, we got to take a break. Let's talk more about that. And let's talk about whether or not this is an ideological problem, uh, or whether it's more of a uh, systemic problem. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. 